In the name of him who was and who is and who is to come, our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, your souls have been purchased from sin and death by his holy and precious blood. The word of the Lord that I invite you to meditate upon with me at this time in our worship tonight is that which is taken from Isaiah chapter 41, verses 8 through 13. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant, I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. This is the word of our Lord. What keeps you up at night? Now, I'm not talking about the crying baby or your snoring spouse. I'm not talking about the aching joints or the blaring sirens of emergency vehicles that are going past your home on the street. Now, what thoughts keep you up at night? What worries, what concerns? What fears keep sleep and rest from finding you? And there's so many of them, aren't there? There are financial fears. How am I going to pay the tuition or the rent or the mortgage this month? There are relationship fears. How am I going to approach my friend about her addiction or about the way she abuses other people without burning my bridge to her? There are health fears. What if the doctors can't treat my cancer? What if they can't repair my back? What if my vision can't be restored? Then what? What am I going to do? Where am I going to turn? And then there's just all the general stuff that's going on around us in our society and world, right? The chaos, the turmoil, the upheaval that's in our communities, that's across our nation, and even worldwide. And we have to ask ourselves, where is this going? And how much worse can it possibly get? It's so unnerving, it's so unsettling. And fear is toxic. Fear paralyzes you, right? Fear traumatizes you. Medical studies have shown that fear is toxic to us physically and emotionally. It takes a toll on us. And so it's with that in our minds that we are undertaking a new sermon series for the next six weeks. In this series, we will be digging into the Word of God for the purpose of listening to God's promises and how they apply to you and me in our lives so that we can go through our lives fearlessly as we seek to hold on to our faith in God and then to live out our faith in God. The lesson that is before us directs our attention to God's people many centuries ago. But as we dig into this lesson, I want you to understand that what God says to his people Israel applies to you and to me today with regard to fear. And one of the reasons why we wrestle so much with fear in our lives is that the things that threaten us are the visible things, right? You can see them. 
but God is invisible. You can't see him. It's kind of like if you remember being a child and you're in the department store with mom or dad and you're walking down the aisle and oh, there's this cool toy and you stop and you start looking at it, playing with it. And when after 30, 30 seconds or a minute and a half, you look up, they're totally out of sight, right? There's that panic that sets in and you're running from aisle to aisle trying to find them. We wonder, did they leave the store? And I'm here all by myself with all these strange people. What's going to happen to me? But eventually you found them, right? And when you found them, you lashed onto their hand. You held tight so that you would never be left alone again. One of the things that you will note in the lesson before us today is that the Lord our God doesn't come to you and me and say, hold on tight to my hand. No, he has something so much better to say to you and me. He says, I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand. You see, your grip and my grip, it can slip. But the grip of the Lord our God is an unbreakable grip. And that is the point that he was making for the people of Israel. You see, through the prophet Isaiah, he had just announced to them what the future held. There was going to be chastisement coming upon his wayward people. A foreign power was going to come in and invade them, and militarily they would crush them. Tens of thousands would die, and hundreds of thousands would be carried away as slaves. And after hearing that announcement, what do you think they assumed? The future is dark. The future is lost. We're such a small nation. We're totally overpowered by this greater nation. And worst of all, it appears that God is not on our side anymore. He's turned against us. He's rejected us. And if he's rejected us, boy, are we in trouble here. And we're even in worse trouble when we face him in judgment. Those are the fears with which the people of Israel were wrestling. And so the Lord had this to say, But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, did you notice the terms the Lord uses to describe his relationship with Israel? He says, you're my servant. You're mine. Not somebody else's. He says, I have chosen you. I've picked you out of all the others to be mine. And you are the descendants of Abraham, my friend. Think about what that means. Abraham was my friend. And who was Abraham? Nobody special. He was born into this world like everybody else, an enemy of God. He was just one man in his household, a small, insignificant group of people. He and his wife Sarah were old and had no kids. And yet God chose Abraham, and God called Abraham his friend, and the implication is, if Abraham is my friend, then Abraham's children are my friends too. I chose him, and I've chosen you. And that takes us to the image of a bunch of kids on the playground, and you probably participated in events like this often. You know, let's say a group of kids are on the playground, and they want to play a softball game. And what's the first thing you do? You pick two captains, right? And then the two captains go about picking from the rest of the group their own teammates. Who gets picked first? The best players. Well, imagine that you're in the group of people who's going to be selected to be on a team, but you totally stink at softball. You can't catch, you can't throw, and you can't hit. And yet with his very first pick, one of the captains says, I choose you. What does that indicate? That he cherishes you, right? That despite all your ineptness, he wants you with him, he wants you on his team, on his side. 
And that's a picture of what the Lord is saying he has done with his people Israel. Despite all your ineptness, despite your inability to love me and serve me, I've still chosen you. Notice what he says. I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners. I called you. You didn't call me. I picked you. And then he goes on and he says, I have chosen you and have not rejected you. Even though you can't see me right now, even though a foreign army is going to come in and make life miserable for you, he says, you are my servant. I have chosen you and I have not rejected you. I'm on your side. Don't be afraid. And what he has to say to his people Israel is also what he has to say to you and me today. You see, the Apostle Paul tells us that God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. You see, from eternity, God knew you, he knew me, he knew how we would be born, he knew that we would totally stink at life, totally that we would be powerless to love him, to trust him, and serve him. He chose you anyway. He chose me anyway. And he didn't demand that we would reach up and take hold of him. But instead, he reached down and he took hold of us. And with the people of Israel, he had a glorious task for them, and that was to be part of his plan to bring a Savior into the world chosen for that too and he's done the same for us that we might declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light and so even though God is unseen at the moment to you and to me he wants us to know that he's with us that he sees us and that he's chosen us and that he is always going to guard us and keep us. And so he says, don't be afraid. Now there are some who may counter this by saying, well, yeah, God tells us that he loves us and that he cares about us. But just because somebody cherishes you and loves you doesn't mean they can necessarily help you. Think of the millions and millions of people throughout the history of this world and presently in this world who are parents and spouses, who love their family members dearly and would in an instant, without hesitation, lay down their lives for a spouse or a child. But yet, when a spouse has dementia, when a child has leukemia or a birth defect, they can't do a thing about it. No matter how much they love their child, no matter how much they love their spouse, they simply sit beside them in helpless love with a bleeding heart. Is that our God? Is that the God of Israel? Does he have love and affection, for, and affection for us, but in a helpless way? Listen to what the Lord says. All who rage against you will surely be put to shame and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Those you search, though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand. Notice what the Lord points to as the reason for them to be confident that his love could guard and keep them because of who he is, right? I am the Lord your God. I am the one who put the distant galaxies in place. I am the one who parted the waters of the Red Sea. I caused the walls of Jericho to tumble down. I'm the one who raised up a nation to crush you 
I am the one who will raise up a nation to crush them so that there will be nothing left of them, just a memory. And the nation who crushes them will restore you, restore you to your homeland so that the promised branch of David would be born in Bethlehem to bear the sin of the world. That is the God of Israel. And that God is your God and my God. And what he accomplished for you and for me was to prepare a future for us that is certain, a future for us, a treasure for us in heaven, as we heard in our gospel lesson, that cannot perish or spoil or fade. It is absolutely secure. And so what does that mean for you and me? Well, it means that you absolutely have nothing to fear. When sleep doesn't find you at night because of all the concerns and worries and fears that are flushing through your mind, that are seizing your heart, then remember that the God of Israel is the Lord your God. That this is the God who is with us. Though he exists outside of time and space, he is the one who came into our time and space. He became Emmanuel. He sent his own son into this world, and he took hold of your wrongs, all of your wrongs, so that he could give you all of his rights. And consider how Jesus accomplished that. Not by going around humiliation and suffering, abandonment and death, but by going through them, through them right into the grave. And in so doing, he took your sin and my sin with him. He totally obliterated it, it's gone. And he came out the other side, gloriously victorious. And he promises full forgiveness and life everlasting with him. That's what's yours because of who your God is. He has chosen you and he has almighty power to make his choice valid and to carry it out. So brothers and sisters, As you go through your life, remember the Lord your God. And know that he is not the God who says, hold on to my hand, but rather he is the one who says, I am holding on to your hand. And so when you lay down your head on the pillow at night, remember the words of the Lord your God. He says, I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your hand. I am with you. Do not be afraid. Sleep well, brothers and sisters. Amen. Please stand.